you know, we see them every day. Uh, bridges we drive over, pipes, machinery, all sorts of things. And behind that, behind all that strength, there's this hidden layer, right? A quality control process most of us probably never think about. Absolutely. It's fundamental, really. Yeah. It's where the blueprint meets reality and making sure that connection is sound. Well, that's critical for safety, for performance, mm. quality control. And yeah, a big part of that falls to one specific role. Exactly. And that's what we're diving into today. Mm -hmm. The welding inspector. We're basing this on a source you shared with us, looking specifically at the well, the typical duties of someone doing this vital job. Yeah, our mission here is to really unpack this source, go beyond just a list of tasks. You know, we want to figure out what's most important, what really makes an inspector effective, some of the surprising requirements maybe, and how they ensure welded stuff is safe, reliable, meets the standard. Let's uh, let's get into it. Okay, so at its core, what's the main goal? What are welding inspectors really there for? Big picture. It all boils down to quality control, QC. They're key players, making sure welded items meet the specifications they're supposed to. Basically, confirming a weld is fit for purpose, whether that's holding up a skyscraper or containing, say, high-pressure steam. So they're the gatekeepers. Checking the weld can actually do the job. And I guess to make those calls, they need a pretty solid base of knowledge. Oh, absolutely. You can't inspect what you don't understand, right? Employers need to trust them, so inspectors need a strong grip on QC procedures, definitely. But also, and this is crucial, a sound knowledge of welding technology itself. How welds are made, what makes a good weld. Makes perfect sense. You need to know the craft to judge it. Now, the source really highlights visual inspection. That seems like the starting point. It is. Visual inspection, it's actually classed as one of the non-destructive examination disciplines, NDE. Basically, using your eyes, maybe some simple tools to check the weld surface, the shape. And what's interesting is, for some jobs, a visual check might be the only inspection needed. Really? Just looking, that sounds maybe a bit basic for critical stuff. Well, it might seem basic, but it's incredibly effective when done right. And it's always the first step. For things under tougher conditions, yeah, visual is usually just the start. It's typically followed by other non-destructive tests and DT, uh, things like surface crack detection or volumetric checks like x-rays or ultrasound, especially for critical welds like butt welds where you need to see through the weld, not just the surface. Got it. So visual first, then potentially deeper dives with other tech. Mm -hmm. Okay, where do inspectors find the rules, the criteria for pass or fail? Ah, those all-important acceptance criteria. They usually come from application standards or codes. These are the documents that say, for this specific type of weld, in this specific application, this is what's acceptable. And they often dictate which other NDT methods you need to use, too. Okay, so the application standard sets the quality bar for the weld and says what tests. But the source mentions something interesting, a separate standard just for the visual part. Exactly, yeah. And this is a key point. The application standard tells you what flaws are okay or not okay and which tests to run, but it often doesn't go deep into how to actually do the visual inspection itself. For that guidance, the basic requirements on the how-to of visual checks, you look at standards like ISO 16637. That's the specific international standard for visual examination of fusion welds. Ah, okay. So ISO 17637 is the how-to guide for the inspector's visual technique. What kind of things does it cover? Practical stuff. Oh, yeah. It gets pretty specific. It covers requirements for the personnel, you know, the inspector themselves. It talks about the right conditions for doing the examination, gives advice on using aids like gauges, guidance on keeping records, and even points to when inspection might be needed during the whole fabrication process. Let's dig into those personnel requirements from ISO 17637 first. What does it say about the inspector? Well, first off, before they even start on a project, the standard says they've got to be familiar with all the relevant stuff, standards, rules, specs for that specific job, and they need to know about the welding procedures being used. Can't really check something against the plan if you don't know the plan, right? Makes total sense. And there's a very specific physical requirement, too, isn't there? Maybe a bit surprising. Yes. And this really shows how hands-on it is. They absolutely must have good vision, checked every year according to standards like EN 473. It's critical, you know? Yeah. How can you spot a tiny hairline crack or a subtle profile issue if your eyesight isn't sharp? Wow, down to the eyesight check. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now, the source mentioned an interesting point about qualifications versus what actually happens in the industry. Right, this is where reality often adds another layer to the standard. ISO 11637 itself, um, it doesn't actually mandate a formal qualification just for visual inspection. But the source points out 
In practice, the industry really expects inspectors to have practical experience plus a recognized qualification. It mentions CS Swipe as a common example. So industry best practice goes a step further than the baseline standard for confidence. Okay, what about the environment? The conditions needed for a good visual inspection, according to ISO 17637. Lighting, that's key. The standard specifies a minimum of 350 lux, but recommends 500 lux or more. And 500 lux, that's roughly like normal shop or office lighting, bright enough to see details clearly. Good benchmark. And access, how close do they need to be? Also specified for direct visual, your eye needs to be within 600 millimeters, about two feet of the surface. And the viewing angle shouldn't be less than 30 degrees. There's apparently even a diagram showing this in the source. Specific distances, angles, making sure they get a proper look. What if they just can't get that close or the angle's impossible? That's where aids come in, and the standard covers that too. If you mm -hmm. can't get direct access, you might use things like mirrored borescopes or fiber optic systems. Often needs agreement between the client and fabricator though. And you might need extra lighting, auxiliary lighting, to help create contrast and make imperfections stand out. Using tech to get eyes where they need to be. What other tools were in the visual inspector's kit? Specific equipment. Yeah, the source lists quite a few essentials. Crucially, dedicated welding gauges. These aren't just rulers, they're precision tools for checking things like bevel angles before welding, the final weld profile, fillet weld sizes, even measuring undercut depth. There are also specific gauges for checking weld gaps and that linear misalignment sometimes called hilo. And of course, basic stuff like straight edges and tapes for dimensions. What about getting a closer look? Magnification. Yeah. If they use a magnifying lens, ISO 11637 says it should be between X2 and X5 magnification. The source apparently goes into good detail here, showing different gauges, their uses, even their precision. Clearly a defined toolkit and method. Now, ISO GUS 3637 also talks about when inspections happen. What's the minimum requirement? The baseline, according to ISO 17637, is that examination is normally done on welds as welded. So at the very least, you visually inspect the finished weld. That's the minimum. Just checking the final product is the absolute baseline. But I guess that's not always enough. Oh, definitely not for everything. The standard makes it clear. The extent of the examination and the specific stages where inspection happens, well, that's usually set by the application standard or agreed between the client and the fabricator. And I bet for the really critical stuff, inspection happens throughout. Absolutely spot on. For high integrity items, think pressure vessels, critical pipelines, big structures inspection, usually happens across the entire fabrication process. So inspectors are involved before welding starts, checking fit up and prep, during welding, maybe checking parameters or interrun cleaning, and then after welding is done. Those are the typical duties that really span the whole project for important work. Okay, so it's continuous for critical jobs. Beyond those visual checks, what other core duties span the project. A big one right from the get-go is being totally familiar with all the project paperwork. The source really stresses this. The inspector needs to know all the relevant standards, rules, specifications for that contract inside out. These are their reference points. And what kind of documents are we talking about? Key examples. Several are mentioned. The main one is the application standard or code. That's where the visual acceptance criteria live. Although the source makes an interesting point here. While standards give lots of clear rules, some things are just inherently tricky to define perfectly with words or numbers. Tricky to define? Like what, for example? Things like uh, subtle shape tolerances, maybe a bit of distortion, minor surface scuffs, or how much weld spatter is too much. It's not always a simple measurement. The requirement might just call for good workmanship. Ah, good workmanship. Sounds subjective. How do they handle that? How is that judged? That's where experience really kicks in, guided by the project context. The source defines good workmanship as basically the standard a competent worker should hit easily with the right tools and setup. Mm -hmm. In practice, it often depends on the application. What's fine for a fence post isn't okay for a turbine blade, or the client spec might define the level needed. So the end use and client needs add another layer of interpretation. Exactly, and sometimes to make that subjective part more concrete, especially for things like weld surface finish or how smoothly the weld blends in at the toe or the finish needed if it's going to be ground smooth, they might use reference samples, actual physical examples agreed on beforehand showing this is what acceptable looks like for that specific detail on this job. That's clever. A visual standard for the visual standard. Uh-huh. What other documents are vital? 
They'll rely heavily on quality plans or inspection checklists. These spell out what needs checking, how much, and when. Drawings are obviously critical for assembly, fit-up dimensions, and they need to know the company's own QC procedures, backward and forward document control, how materials are handled, electrode storage, and crucially, the welding procedure specifications, the WPSs. Those are the recipes for making specific welds correctly. Wow. So the inspector is juggling international standards, client demands, company rules, drawings, and even making judgment calls based on samples. That's a lot. What about the tools, the gauges? Any requirements there? Oh, yes. The source mentions that, too. The tool gauges, any other aids they have to be kept in good shape and calibrated, you know, as required by the procedures. Their accuracy depends on their tools being reliable. Makes sense. Yeah. And working on sites, safety must be a constant thought. Absolutely. Safety awareness is a basic duty for everyone, inspectors included. They need to know the safety rules, make sure they have the right safety gear, and that it's suitable for whatever they're doing. It's clearly a demanding role. Technical skill, document knowledge, sharp eyes, detail-oriented, safety-minded. Now, with all this checking, are records always kept? Detailed reports. It actually varies quite a bit. Depends on the contract, the type of fabrication. The source notes that, surprisingly often maybe, no formal record or report is required at all. Really? Even for critical checks? Not always a separate formal report, no. But when a record is needed, its job is to provide that proof, the objective evidence, that things were checked at the right times and met the standards. The form can vary. Could be just a signature on a checklist saying, yep, done. Or, for more critical work, yeah, it might be a detailed individual report for each item or weld. And if they do need an individual report, what kind of details does ISO 17637 suggest including? ISO 17637 gives a list of typical info, things like uh, who made it, the manufacturer, fabricator, what exactly was examined, item ID, the material type and thickness, the joint type welding process used, and critically, which acceptance standard or criteria they judged it against. And the results, especially if something failed. Yes, definitely. The report has to list the locations and types of any unacceptable flaws they found. The source adds that sometimes the contract might even demand a sketch or a photo of the flaw. And finally, it needs the inspector's name and the date they did the check. That level of detail really creates a clear history, a traceable record for important work. Exactly. It provides that essential documentation trail. Okay, let's try and pull this all together, connect it back to you, the listener. Hmm. This deep dive, using the source you shared, has really given us a window into the welding inspector's world. Yeah, we've seen it's a role demanding incredible focus, hasn't it? From specific vision tests and using calibrated tools to knowing complex standards and procedures inside out. And we've seen that crucial human element too, judging good workmanship, staying safe. Right. It's not just ticking boxes. It's absolutely vital for the integrity, the safety of structures and things we rely on constantly. It's this blend, isn't it? Right. Stripped, measurable rules combined with experienced, trained human oversight. It's a fascinating glimpse behind the curtain, really. Shows the dedication needed to ensure things are built strong and reliably. So we've walked through the standards like ISO 17637 that provide the framework, the tools they use, the documents they live by and the human judgment needed to make sure welds are truly right. We saw how some things are black and white, defined by standards, but others, like that good workmanship, need experienced eyes and sometimes even physical samples to get everyone on the same page. Which brings us to a final thought, maybe something for you to consider. How much does the safety and reliability of these complex welded structures we depend on ultimately rest on that necessary meeting point that blend between rigid objective standards and the experienced, sometimes subjective expert applying those standards in the messy reality of the physical world? Something to think about next time you uh, cross a bridge or see a massive piece of welded equipment. 